Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, Monday, January 12th regular meeting of the Dinah School Board. We do have a quorum this evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda is the annual election of the board chair. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Nomination. Uh, I nominate Randy Meyer. Has been of nominated uh, for board chair Randy Meyer, seconded by Kathy. Any additional nominations? All those in favor of electing uh, Randy Meyer board chair, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you all for the privilege to serve. Uh, next up, we have our annual election of board officers. Uh, nominations, please. Vice I'd Chair, like go ahead. To nominate, oops. I'd like to nominate uh, Lenny Wallen Friedman as Vice Chair. Lenny's been nominated Vice Chair. Additional, uh, uh, can I get a second? Second. It's been seconded. Any additional nominations for Vice Chair? Uh, well, how about we do these as a group? Uh, Treasurer, uh, any nominations? I nominate Kathy Sella. Kathy's been nominated as treasurer. I second. You said seconded. Uh, any additional nominations for treasurer? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, clerk. Nominations for clerk. Regina's been nominated. Second. It's been seconded. Any additional nominations for uh, clerk? Seeing none. Um, uh, assistant Treasurer, nominations, please. Assistant. I nominate Sarah Pasloff. Sarah Pasloff, any additional nominations for Assistant Treasurer? We have a second to Sarah's nomination. Second. Okay, and uh, do we have an Assistant Clerk? What's our last one? Assistant Clerk, nomination, please. I nominate Lisa O'Brien. Lisa. And David Goldstein. And I nominate Stuart Wink. I just nominated to it went second okay uh, is that our full slate uh, all those in favor of the uh, any discussion all those in favor of the slate as presented please signify by saying aye. aye aye opposed motion carries thank you all for all your service uh, next up, we have our approval of minutes. We've got a special meeting on December 15th, a special regular meeting on the 15th, a work session on December 17th, and a motion to bring those uh, minutes to the floor for approval. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any additions or corrections to those minutes as written? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes for the December 15th regular and special meeting and also the work session on the 17th, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, as a uh, point of information, uh, we're going to run through our Next Gen Facilities report before we go to hearings from, from members of the audience. So if we can proceed to that, Susan and Rick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members uh, of the board, as well as community members, uh, lead team members. Uh, it's an honor to uh, present this proposal to you, a proposal that's been in the works since 2009. Uh, and uh, we're very excited about how we're going to continue to make sure Edina Public Schools is uh, going to be having a bright future for our young people. Uh, it's very much driven by our educational vision, this vision was approved by the school board back in 2011. It's a commitment to say that we not only want to have a national presence, but an international presence. And over the past three years, we've been working hard with benchmarking some national school districts that align well with us, everything from New Trier outside of Chicago to Palo Alto outside of San Francisco to uh, Westside outside of Omaha. All these schools are all in the same type of vision around personalized learning and really making sure our young people are ready for their world. We're also going to start benchmarking with Nancy and partnering with international schools to see how we can continue to uh, promote and grow our skills and talents for our young people as they look to a very bright and exciting future. 
It's very much driven by the thought of we want our young people to be successful in college, career, and life. The key with this is that learning is the constant and our variables are around time, talent, funds, and space. Uh, tonight's conversation is really focused on this space. Uh, it's our work that uh, we're going to continue to uh, talk about over the next several months uh, as the board proceeds and the community proceeds in this conversation. The next gen is uh, an exciting plan that we bring forward around our facilities, our next generation facilities, because we're truly going to teach or touch every learner. This is about touching all learners at all ages at all of our 10 sites. We recognize an opportunity after doing the study and working closely with the task force that we can do that, that we can make sure that all of our facilities are ready for how we need to continue to create learning experiences for our young people and for people of all ages going forward. This is a plan that's been very successful for our school district community uh, since the 1980s when uh, we started looking at how we could use our current facilities and with a focus on security, a focus on learning, and a focus on infrastructure that we'd make sure that our schools are ready for our young people going forward. Uh, back in the early 90s, we did an upgrade and went back to our community and asked for improvements. And again in 2003, we went back to our community. Each time we do this, there's an alignment, and it's exciting to see how the work that we did in 2003 that was finished in 2007 is it continues to be very functional, but also aligns well with what we're doing in our next steps of our work. And so the, the work that was completed earlier in this century is going to align well as we look forward to going into the 2020 um, decade of the 21st century. Around this work, we've gone through several phases, starting in 2009, a phase of early study, uh, taking a look at our infrastructure, taking a look at some of our needs. Uh, we continued to do this work, and then um, especially a lot of work was done in October of uh, September and October when we formed a task force, a 24-member community and staff task force that took a look at having six long meetings where they did a look at all of our needs and really tried to do some uh, program refinement. From there, the board uh, learned of the information from that study, then moved into working with our administration, having some community meetings, some dialogues with our staff to do some refinement. And on December 15th, we brought our concept proposal to the board for, the, for discussion. Since that proposal, we've continued to do refinement. We've created a schedule where we're going to go out and get, get more input and more direction uh, as we uh, continue to draw on this concept, but we know that the number that we're looking at that does make sense for us to meet these educational needs is that $24.9 million. Uh, excuse me, $124 million. $124.9 million. Uh, when I talk about these discussions, we're talking about um, the environmental discussions that we need to have, and we've started those discussions and continue to have them with Three Rivers Watershed District, Nine Mile mm -hmm. Creek, uh, with the City of Edina, the various entities that uh, help support our work when we start talking about facilities and grounds. We're also having discussions on safety and accessibility uh, as it relates with our neighbors, uh, with traffic and accessibility. This, these discussions will continue to go forward as we proceed with this effort. And finally, around programming and working with our staff. And this will be a heavy focus starting uh, in the first part of February. We really start defining exactly how we're putting this plan into action at a classroom level and working both in the classroom as well as co-curricular and also taking a look at some of our community needs going forward. Again, the timeline hits some of these high spots. Uh, if the board takes action tonight, uh, we will then move forward to moving it to the Minnesota Department of Education or MDE for them to do a review and comment. We have that report uh, already prepared and we'll do some refinement on that but forward that for their review and comment on to uh, once we'd have that, we'd be able to continue to move forward. We'd continue with our discussions at a community level and the information campaigning so our community can make an informed vote and also continue to refine our concept plan. In March, we start our absentee ballots, and then in May, we'd have the special election. Once that special election is completed, we would then move into the formal design phase, the bid process, and the construction. The design process actually starts uh, in summer and fall. This is when we start uh, really going deep into the details with the blueprints, et cetera. The bidding goes out in the winter and construction would be uh, starting soon after uh, summer of 2016, summer of 2017, but also during the 2016-2017 school year. 
The reason we're doing this in May is because of the opportunities that we have to ensure that we make these changes as soon as possible. This does allow us to advantageous of completing this over a two-year process. It would allow us to do the bid work um, in the fall and winter of 2015 and then move forward with uh, actually getting construction going and save us a year of time. Um, the administrative recommendation, again, as I want to highlight, is uh, based on refinement that the board did receive uh, since the uh, report was uh, forwarded by the task force, and uh, we're bringing it here for action tonight. Again, as we look at this uh, proposal, we're looking at a variety of instructional spaces. We know that one size classroom doesn't fit all learning. And as we look uh, going forward, we know that we'll continue to seek um, this type of variety of space, both uh, at a small, small group space, uh, direct instruction similar to the classroom space we have, uh, individual space, and large group performance areas. We see some of this occurring already in our schools. We've done some pilot projects. We see this in other school districts that have already moved through these phases, and we see this as an advantageous time for us to move as a school district in this direction. As we look at this proposal, the $124.9 million project, $107 million of this will focus on our learning spaces, uh, early childhood, elementary, middle, high school, and activity center. When we look at the early childhood programming, we're seeing this, to, again, a focus on security, which is one of our primary focuses throughout this proposal. But taking a look at uh, supporting our three- and four-year-old programming, there's an area of program we want to continue to grow. We also know that we can do this all on our first floor here at the community center. When we look at our elementary programming, again, we'd be touching all six of our elementary schools around security, but also, again, on these variety of spaces. We see some of this occurring already in our traditional classroom, our tr traditional schools. Mm -hmm. Our elementary schools really haven't had an upgrade for several, a uh, couple decades, and so it's time for us to be able to make some adjustments that we know will enhance learning uh, for our youngest people. Again, there's still a focus on how we can best use our space with our teachers to make learning a great experience for our learners. Uh, outdoor space will also be part of that, so we'll be looking at how we can enhance uh, playgrounds and outdoor play areas as well for our young people. The middle school, uh, the middle school will continue again, have a focus on security. Um, we want to move uh, to a new middle school model, which is a six through eight, at very much of a traditional middle school approach. Th we also then want to make sure our building is reflects <coughs> that uh, program uh, change. And so we'll create some uh, new options. Uh, throughout this proposal, another area that's making a lot of change is our media centers. Uh, our media centers are no longer that place where you come to get information. It really is a place where you do the problem solving and create. And so uh, it's a reformatting of how we use our media centers, our library spaces, uh, to make that more effective for our learners. Uh, we're also looking at some of our specialized spaces. Um, in the middle school, we'll also be making uh, some change as it relates at Southview uh, around uh, their entrance and moving their entrance from the north side of the building to the south side of the building, which is a more common uh, location for that um, best spot for uh, making sure we have a, a welcome site for all learners, especially as they get off those buses. Our high school, again, is uh, $31 million. Much of this is uh, due to the need to move our ninth grade to the high school. This will allow us to make sure our ninth grade through 12th grade has that quality high school experience. We know, uh, again, from the assessment work and the strategic planning that our ninth grade are ready for more and a deeper experience in their learning, and this will allow us to do that. We also know that 12th grade year is going to continue to evolve and change. And so what we'll be doing is creating additional spaces, 28 to 30 additional classroom spaces. Again, we'll align with our programming to make sure they're effective um, for us going forward. And uh, that would be $31 million for our high school. Part of that high school experience also, we need to have a multi-purpose activity center. This is not just a uh, traditional space, but this is, uh, again, looking at a variety of space to meet our curricular needs at the high school with bringing our ninth grade to the high school. We have some additional curricular space needs. We know that wellness, fitness, 
uh, physical education, we know that athletics, uh, co-curricular activities, co-ed activities, it's going to continue to grow as we go forward, and so we need that additional space. We also know that by allowing us to grow in our multi-purpose space here at the high school, it's going to free up space at our middle schools and expand programming for after school and middle schools, because right now all of the middle school large group space is taken up by high school space. Um, Co-curricular needs, again, we mentioned that. And then there's also some community-based needs that we think we can complement um, in using our school uh, as a community place after those school hours that we can enhance uh, how we use our facilities and maximize the interest of all of our community. Um, we will be including uh, improvements as it relates to handicap accessibility, uh, especially in our lower fields. So that's also part of this uh, project. When we look at um, the improvements, uh, this is a aerial site of our high school. Uh, Susan, maybe you can show us some. Uh so some of the areas that we're looking at, while again, the specific designs haven't been taken in, but here you're looking at the high school. Highway 62 is up here. Um, and so we're talking about for the high school addition, perhaps looking here, perhaps also looking here to do some of that 65,000 uh, square feet. It might not all be in one addition. It could be in a couple of areas to accommodate the best, the most, uh, most appropriate spaces for some of those learning needs that we have. We're also looking at an activity center to kind of be built right here into the side of this hill. Um, we have looked at a variety of access opportunities for that, and uh, Dr. Justin will address those a little bit later, but then some of, we just wanted to kind of provide that aerial, and we can come back to this photo to show where we could possibly look at some um, access points to that activity center if indeed we do look at that. So we're also looking at the infrastructure work, and this includes uh, in, uh, improving our security enhancements beyond just what we do at our site levels. We also want to do some uh, zone lockdown capabilities, some additional cameras and technologies, um, our outdoor athletic spaces. Um, we know that, again, from the assessment work, that there's a need for us to continue to look at artificial turf as a way of uh, addressing uh, our, our green space. Um, the play on grass fields just does not stand up uh, given our, our community demands and our uh, demands of our students. So we're looking at some additional uh, outdoor turf as well as uh, parking access and then um, studying our transportation facility. That's a project that's really been discussed since the early 2000s of how we can possibly enhance uh, that transportation site where it's undersized for our needs and uh, going forward we recognize uh, some opportunities for us to look differently at that facility. Some of the community updates, uh, since uh, our um, December meeting, uh, we are having uh, specific discussions going on around some of this refinement and preparation in our, in our design plan, uh, specifically the West Campus neighborhood conversations. We've had conversations with the Creek Valley uh, around some of the things that uh, we know what our needs are. We're listening to our neighbors' needs at the Creek Valley, both on the east and the west side of our high school, of trying to find out what are some best ways we can service our needs as well as their needs. Um, again, we're early on the process, and so we're uh, really doing some assessment work. We've met initially with uh, one group, uh, the west side. We're going to be meeting with the east side tomorrow mm -hmm. and uh, continue those conversations with them going forward. Again, uh, and recognize that other sites, too, we may be having neighborhood conversations just to say how do we continue to work in a neighborly way to meet our needs as well as the neighborhood needs. Um, so we'll have that going on. Um, and some of the discussions that we heard uh, very much so last week with our, our neighbors to the west of the West Campus um, did articulate a concern about the, the road extension of Creek Valley Road, and so we are exploring other opportunities with that, particularly perhaps something that's already currently on our site. And um, when, we look, when we took another look at the budget, we reviewed that we do have some um, site plan development budget built into that, as well as some contingencies that we always build into construction projects. And we believe that we should be able to accommodate um, perhaps an alternative, we just don't know exactly where that might be, but trying to find the best alternative to be both neighborly and to meet our facility needs. From a financial standpoint, then we take that $107 million plus the $17.8 million um, proposal. Again, it comes up to the $124.9 million proposal. Uh, the impact uh, to uh, property owners, uh, you can see the monthly impact as well as the annual impact. Um, 
it, it's a commitment. We know, uh, again, in our polling, both last spring and again this fall, uh, the community is supportive of this range. They want to have a good understanding of how this is going to improve learning and how this is going to improve uh, what's, what our plans are for a school district going forward. But uh, we have a level of support for this. Uh, again, uh, we will be doing more conversation to help uh, the community understand not only uh, the impact financially, but the impact educationally of how this will support uh, the learning going forward. Um, that concludes kind of the overview of this proposal. Again, it's um, a proposal that was began an earnest study uh, this fall, a lot of conversation at our board meeting since this fall. Uh, we had a discussion uh, at the December meeting and t tonight the administration is recommending that the board move forward with this. The language proposal that will be brought forward later in the meeting is very specific uh, based on state statute. Um, and the concept drawings is the, the process that is used in the school construction uh, around concept drawing and they're trying to do the refinement through the process. But the design phase really wouldn't occur until after um, the referendum is successful. Uh, take any questions at this time from the board? Questions? There will also be an opportunity prior to the vote. Uh, okay. Sir, any questions? Well, I'm just wondering if you could share, have you thought about, um, say, a priority list in terms of the order of construction or the, the process that will go forward in terms of the, um, you know, we have six elementary schools, two junior highs, the high school, since we're shifting bodies to the high school, would the anticipation be to complete one before the other? maybe share with some of the thoughts around that process as well as how then, um, you know, if, if we do look at priorities, where does the activity center fall into that list of priorities? So, so it's, a, it's a phase construction, you know, and so uh, again, uh, some preliminary discussions have been about obviously completing that high school construction first so the ninth grade could be moved to the high school. Uh, we think the elementaries can move separately because they s they're a standalone project mm -hmm. and so that we're uh, in better shape to be able to do that. Our middle schools would probably be our last phase of the project once we have the ninth grade um, pulled from the middle school, though some work could be going on during that same time. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's technical, and I, so I don't know all the detail of it as far as um, making sure that occurs, but that's kind of been the preliminary discussions going on at this point. Oh, sorry. And we're also looking to align, um, assuming that this is successful, that any construction would be aligned with our deferred maintenance alternative facilities plan. So the plans that we have for improving infrastructure and the you know heating and ventilation and stuff, that we would want to align those so that you were not taking something out and doing it again a year later. So we would want to align the timelines of the construction with that as well. Additional questions? Lane? So at, at what point do we get a specific list of the order that the work is done in? Is that, uh, presumably it's after the design stage? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think as we continue to move forward over the next few months, we'll continue to see a, a refinement process. But um, yeah, I, I would think once we get uh, through into the design phase, we'll have it down right. more specifically. And we've obviously gotten a, a fair number of emails in the last few days from people who live in, I think, the Creek Valley Estate area is maybe what it's called. Can you address some of the specific concerns that they've referenced in those emails? Hopefully you've got a summary there. Sure, yeah. So um, as we articulated earlier, um, that there are some specifically the, the, lar the largest concern that we heard, obviously there's multiple. Everybody has different concerns, but the largest concern has to do with the Creek Valley Road, that extension. And so currently the on the Creek Valley Road, the, the uh, road does kind of butt into our current property. And so the one of the original proposals that we were looking at would potentially uh, extend that road with the parking lot um, down below the activity center. Um, and looking with that and talking with our neighbors, we uh, believe we might have come up with uh, an alternative or two that would take it actually more from the valley east side off of the current Valley View uh, ring road there and down into in a, in a different kind of a parking situation that would um, mostly be for handicap and maybe some additional parking as well, but really would be taking it from our current property rather than extending through the neighborhood. So, so in 2009, when we were looking at uh, artificial turf um, down in this lower field, we did have a proposal, and so we actually have some uh, documentation work on how a, a road coming from the east side of the high school uh, could move down to that lower field. 
There was also discussion of taking us, having us take a look at this west side road that uh, is an entrance road and seeing, uh, again, there's quite a bit of grade here, but, but this is another area that we're exploring that option. And so those are two of the other uh, proposals that are, so all three of those were, were areas that uh, we've talked about uh, preliminarily and um, we're continuing to study going forward. And then I think additionally there were concerns about um, environmentally, um, if I could borrow this for a minute. Um, so up along here, you know, we have the Nine Mile Creek and um, so we've been, ha we had uh, some discussions, Eric Hamilton can speak to that, our Director of Buildings and Grounds, um, the discussion that we had with the uh, uh, Nine Mile Creek Watershed Trail, Three Rivers, I don't know, Watershed District. Hi there, Nine Mile Creek Watershed District. We met with them along with uh, um, Three Rivers Park District talked about that lower area and um, meeting the requirements for the setbacks, meeting the requirements for um, uh, water runoff, and knowing where the um, um, wetland delineation is. And um, a very productive meeting. Um, didn't see um, any, they didn't give us any real roadblocks. They gave us the parameters that we would have to meet and no matter where we were building on our site. And um, I thought the, the meeting went very well and gave us some good um, background information, about, um, um, including in the group was um, AJA, our civil engineer, um, our architect, and then myself from the school district. So I think we had um, good representation and a good uh, discussion without any real, real big flags flying. And part of that um, ongoing discussion then once we have a little bit more idea about where we might put something, we would be doing a more um, environmental impact as well. I have two questions. Uh, one, I, I know that on tonight's vote, we're not including any language that would address the potential access to any of the development of the fields. But as we're exploring the development of our property for looking at some of that access, either for handicap parking or access to the activity center, what is the time frame for when that kind of design would move forward? And then my second question is a companion regarding parking. We've had some discussion regarding some different places to add some parking, and I know that some of the questions coming from um, community discussion asked about parking ramp. And I believe that we have had some world architect or maybe engineering discussion regarding the feasibility of a ramp. Um, as far as the ramp, uh, we looked at uh, exploring that the cost would be, I think, 10 times the cost of a, of a surface lot, um, which would be pretty significant to try to build a ramp. Um, in terms of parking, we have been looking at um, other areas. We know that the area where the cursor is right now is already, we're already thinking we would need that as an additional parking to accommodate. Um, we have parking constraints currently, and then we would be adding some additional staff, obviously by bringing some of the ninth grade, bringing the ninth graders over there, so we know that we're gonna need a little bit more parking as it stands right now. Um, but then looking at um, going up into that area would might be potentially where we could be looking at a parking. We're looking at um, grade and, and what other kinds of uh, watershed issues might be arising there, but we feel like we might be able to do something there. Again, nothing's definite. And as far as, um, I can speak to a timeline, and then um, timeline, uh, these conversations are, are occurring, and they're occurring pretty uh, efficiently, and we're hoping that by the January 25th board meeting, we would have some sort of an update for you and the public, and then we also um, are committed to direct communication with our neighbors to the, the east and west of the high school as well. Th that'll also determine some of our uh, traffic flow our traffic study work going on uh, not only here at the high school but some of the other sites. So uh, we do want to move forward with that planning because that'll help shape uh, the traffic study. And I think that was one of my questions that people were asking about is, is that traffic there is difficult and now if we're adding a ninth grade um, that we're likely to see an increase in traffic. So how can we sort of mediate that and how are we monitoring that? So you talked about that a little but. S so one of the things again we can, we'll be able to be also looking at uh, master schedules and daily schedules and looking at phase um, scheduling releases. So we, we know that uh, those are options that are being accessed in other school districts and it's something that we'd be studying as well to try to mitigate some of those uh, challenges with that. And one other um, people had asked, and we have discussed, but I don't know if we talked about it in a form like this, is in terms of why not build up on the high school that currently exists instead of going into the space around it? 
also uh, structurally we're limited in how much we can actually build on top of our current facility. Uh, we don't have the infrastructure down below to support another building on top of there, but we do believe that within the confines of the of the space that you're looking at right there that we can probably make those additions with the exception of the activity center fit within that ring road that you see mm -hmm. uh, coming around. But the activity center um, is uh, at least the bulk <coughs> of that activity center that we're um, proposing tonight. The 60 to 70,000 square foot facility would be built into the side of the hill, but it would be attached to the high school itself. Additional questions? A um, couple of questions. Do we yet know whether it's feasible with the wetlands in the area to build what we're thinking of building, be it uh, parking towards the west side or parking towards the east side? Um, yes, the parking um, is very feasible um, in relation to the, the wetlands that we currently have. Um, we've had um, more than a couple groups look at it and, and um, and see that it, it fits well outside that wetland area. The field house or the um, addition off the north end um, is going to be um, several feet above. Um, in other words, we're not going to go all the way down to the parking lot level or the drive level. That building itself will be several feet above that, that point. And then obviously we haven't decided the where the access comes from at this point when we get to the point where we actually say, okay, we're going to access through this direction or that direction, is that something that comes to the board to vote and approve, or is that something that we've delegated to administration? So I think what we'll be doing is, and this sounds like a superintendent response, but, but I, I think we need to, to have some more definition. I think, again, the board's going to have a finance and a facilities committee, and I think that committee will provide us direction on how we want to proceed if we want to, if that's a significant enough step that we want board action around how we'd proceed on that or not. I mean, it would be something certainly something that we could uh, consider, but I think we'd seek a committee input on that, and that would kind of direct uh, the action that would go forward. I think we do want to define it, because it, it's a big enough question. There may be some other questions as we go through this process that we want to make sure we are um, have clarified to help, uh, again, make sure it's an informed vote. Just, just following up on that, I, I think it's a concern to be voting tonight without having a clear understanding that it remains the board's, within the board's decision making as to how we proceed in access. I mean, ultimately that may be something we want to delegate, but I, I think it would be very hard to vote yes or no tonight thinking that that's disposed of by this vote. So I, I'd at least like to see that clear. Well, so the, so that's, it's typical, I mean, that would be something you can determine, you know, I. And I'm, I'm certainly supportive of that. That, that. that was just my effort to try to determine that, or at least <laughs> yeah. make, make my view on that clear. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. Additional questions or comments? And so do we have a, personally, I've never had a, a renovation come in under budget. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And so I'm wondering, do we have a priority list of the, you know, this was raised this today by uh, a member at PLC in terms of, you know, we have things that we must have, things that would be, we should, we'd be nice to have and things that maybe are at the end. And so what happens if the economy goes crazy or our bids come out or is there a priority list? What is the administration thinking in terms of how do we prioritize So, so there's a formal process that you go through, it's called value engineering that you place your highest value and, and that becomes a priority. We, we experienced that in 2003 uh, as a school district community because of uh, some pricing that occurred uh, that we had to address. And, um, you know, again, one of the things that Wold Architect was selected for was their ability to do a great job of doing some preliminary assessment work. And if you check in with what other school districts have seen as far as successful, um, that's what they're finding. And why is that is very satisfied that working with Wold Architect right now, and in fact, they'll be releasing bids uh, over the next month, uh, but feel like they're in a very good position. That being said, the variables are always there. Mm -hmm. The variables are always there, uh, but we do feel between Wold Architect and then us moving forward with the construction management process, we think those are two models. Those two check and balances will ensure that uh, we uh, stay within our limits and still meet our needs uh, educationally. 
Additional questions? So kind of a, as a follow-up to that, the way I look at the priority list, I if you were, no one particularly asked me, but I would list safety as the first thing that we should be spending money on. The ninth grade to the high school would be the second, the th second priority. Uh, I don't have a preference necessarily between the middle school and the elementary. I do value the activity center, but I, when it comes to which are the most important, the ones that are directly tied to our school day are the ones that are most important from my perspective. And so if we get to the point of, of having to value engineer, um, that would be my priority list with the activity center at the end of the list. Because certainly we would be, when we get to that design phase and go to the specifics, we'll be looking at that. It is important to remember that part of that activity center is part of the ninth grade move over that we need some additional uh, fire and health wellness kinds of course spaces and large group ec um, learning spaces as well. But certainly we can be looking at that when it comes time for the, for the priority list and the design phase. And one other thing we've heard about, not to move off of the access road, but uh, we've heard from the, the theater and the orchestra and the band most recently about whether there's enough space in their area. And I, I raised this at the last question, but I think that the answer is that we will be able to accommodate the ninth grade in terms of orchestra and band in a way that is consistent with the program we've built. So as we continue to design what that ninth through 12th program will, we'll make sure there are spaces. Again, we, we all we right now have identified our class spaces. So we haven't determined uh, what type of space they are because the program design has to be. So if we indeed have a uh, need for, you know, additional orchestra and band space, that, that we'll make sure that happens. If it's additional lab space for um, our robotics work or our pre-engineering program, if it's, you know, shifts wherever that has to be, we'll be able to design to that. And so we will meet those needs. And so I know this is hard to go to the community to ask for money um, without having specifics and that's, it's really hard. So I guess my question is, at what, where are we building in, or if you could, I'm sure, where do we have places for the community to be involved in terms of whether the, d the design process or how are we tying that into the, to the next phases? So I, again, I think we'll, we'll call on a variety of different ways to get input. I, we may be calling back to the, uh, the task force that did a lot of preliminary work and, and did some of the early refinement work and supporting that. Um, I think as we get more specific to early childhood, we'll want to zero in on working with the early childhood families, possibly, as well as the early childhood staff. But I think across the board, when we're looking at that uh, activity center, we'll want to work with uh, those that are involved with that programming. And so, uh, I again, we can base it on history of how we did it in the past. Uh, again, one of the reasons we're with Wald Architect is because they do have a very nice plan of involving the community and staff in the design work while still staying true to the uh, vision and the mission of the project. And I think in addition to that, over the next several months from tonight going forward <coughs> would be that, you know, we have some information sharing that we need to do, but we also want to be using those opportunities and um, community dialogues to continue the listening and to continue the conversations like we had last week to say, you know, we know that we're going to have to keep looking forward to the design phase, but what kinds of things should we be thinking about as we approach that design phase? So we're going to be trying to put together a calendar over the next couple of days to say, you know, or the next week or so to say, here's when all these different community opportunities are, whether this is uh, information, we're pushing out information, whether it's an online dialogue, whether they're neighborhood conversations, um, PTO conversations, you know, we have, we plan to be quite visible and not just pushing out information, but also at listening. And you're addressing the time between now and the actual vote in May. Mm -hmm. um, will and then times after, then once after that, then when the design phase comes, we would probably have some more structured, formal conversations about design. What I appreciate about the process and want to thank the community and the administration for doing to this point is providing the board with all of the background on the next generation study. Because what I find has been helpful and clear is that there is truly a need to update our facilities to support learning. So in terms of how I'm viewing this going forward, I see that the need has been articulated very well. Uh, we've had students, parents, teachers, and community members involved with the process to define 
what's needed moving forward for early childhood through grade 12. So I do see that need. Instead of the process being just strictly linear of defining a close set of variables and then moving on to the next set, what I'm seeing is that this is a much more circular process that involves a community at every step of the way. We've sketched out a proposed referendum amount and we know that we, we know the type of learning that it needs to support, but it's only until we've been able to support the fact that yes, we do need a referendum, that we can move forward to the next part, which is going back into more dialogue. And that includes students, teachers, parents, and community to define, okay, now what does it look like? So it's going to be continuing to circulate throughout this process. And even as we move into design phase, in the summer of 2015 and moving forward into the 15-16 potential construction, we'll need that continued input. So I just appreciate the process. I do thank everyone for the input that we've had because it's helped to shape it, but it's far from being finished. What we have is concept and we need to move forward to further define it. And what we're asking for the community in May is an authorization to move forward with that design phase then as well. So some of that um, uh, bond referendum obviously is, is the tax impact, but it's also once we have that authorization from the community, then we can continue those design conversations in more detail. Thanks, Susan. Uh, on a separate note, uh, Margo, I've had some questions about our tax levy back in December and taxes payable in 15. Can you sort of frame up a summary of that, of what the, the tax impact has been for uh, citizens and community? Sure. Um, Mr. Chair and school board, um, the tax levy that we presented in December um, after a three years of about a level tax levy or about flat, um, we did have an increase. Um, the original or preliminary uh, information that came from the state in September was over a 12 percent increase. However, uh, working with Finance and Facilities Committee and the board, we lowered that to a 7.5% increase. At the same time, um, uh, property market values are adjusting and changing, so the overall property value of the district uh, properties were district tax base increased, which means that that tax that the school district is taxing is distributed amongst a larger or a different base. And so when we hold um, property values, the actual tax rate that the school district has, even though the overall levy went up 7.5%, the tax rate went down from the previous taxed year. So on a $100,000 home, if the, if the tax rate was 1%, it might have gone, I'm just giving an ex uh, a, a math example, maybe it's 0.9% now or something like that. So. Um, the actual tax rate went down. So what that means is that if, if your property value and all other things stayed equal on an individual property owner's tax statement um, and, and on the average home, the taxes would have gone down a little over $40 a year. Now it also depends where the value of your home is. So I'm referring to the average home value and, and if somebody did put improvements on their home or their value went up a lot or um, uh, there's a variety of things, other factors that in can impact the taxes, um, but all other things equal, the school district's tax rate went down um, from the previous year. Thank you. Does that help? Mm, yeah, it's a little confusing because we're talking about yeah, increases, it, but it the actual impact on an individual home, assuming the rate was flat, went, went down a little bit yep. from the district's portion. Yeah, on the average home, yep. Additional questions, comments? Thank you very much. Uh, we'd like to uh, welcome and thank the members of our audience who have asked to speak this evening. We have eight individuals who have requested the opportunity to speak. We ask that you please limit your uh, presentation to three minutes. And we also ask that you do not repeat comments that have already been made at tonight's meeting. And a district administrator will follow up with any questions that were raised this evening as a part of any individual's uh, presentation. Um, the first individual who's asked to speak is uh, Mrs. Barbara, uh, Barbara Erlanson. 
And uh, next after Barbara is Carrie Middleton. So I'll announce two names always so people know who's next. So Barbara, welcome. Right. Yes, sit here and grab a mic, please. Um, yes, my name is Barbara Erlinson, and we live at the west end of Creek Valley Road and have done so for 48 years. Our four kids uh, graduated from Edina. As the last house on the block, we looked directly onto the west side high school playing fields, the lower mm -hmm. level. We were there when the school was built, when the watershed and soil experts attempted to develop the, the, that field and use it for extensive activities. However, the creek and Mother Nature Defeat, uh, defeated those plans. There has never been sustained, and I underline sustained, athletic activities in that particular area of our back fields. Um, <coughs> spring thaw was always the worst, and it was even worse when the, after the new addition went up, and I certainly uh, I think that new addition is great. I'm glad it's there. Uh, but the water and mud poured down and made the path a mess, which has never really gone away. A teacher at the high school decided that we needed another pond in the middle of all this, down on that back 40, or the bayou as we call it, um, so the students could contemplate nature. A good idea, but he could have walked over to the perimeter of the field, pulled back the rushes, and discovered not Moses, but wildlife. It's always been there. It would take about 45 quarries of dirt to outwit this creek. It has its ways. Um, in trying to, and I, with Susan, where is Susan? Thank you very much for, for saying that you're going to uh, look at options for our road, Creek Valley. We have a lot of small children there that walk around every day and run around, so we really need to have some sensible options for that, and thanks for looking at that. Um, let's see, pardon. Uh, last thoughts, the building and reconfiguration going on. I believe that Edina High School and Wyzetta High School, as I, I think, still share the title of best high schools in Minnesota. If so, it happened under the watch of teachers in classrooms, still one of the best ways to learn. I know that time marches on and new facility upgrades are needed at times. We near, uh, now hear about open spaces and moving cautiously away from the constant presence of teachers. And, uh, and I quote now, we read of flexible learning spaces and furniture and larger common rooms where students can wo work together in groups and teachers can switch seamlessly working with students one-on-one one on one to larger groups. And I quote too, the plan is really about creating a learning experience rather than just going to school. It has to be more than just a classroom, quote. And I say with all due respect, thousands of kids around the country and world would be happy to just have a classroom, but I understand we, we, we have the facilities to, to do more. Um, I think you, uh, everyone ought to check out the documentary, Waiting for Superman. It's Washington, D.C. schools, and it's tough neighborhoods, and they are waiting just to get into a school. Lastly, uh, where has this been tried? Uh, has it been successful? These questions should be answered before we move forward. I know our schools try to do the best they can, and I appreciate that and respect everyone that's involved there, but they do make mistakes. Flexible modular scheduling in the 70s when my kids w went, when our kids went, and allowing um, students to, with to arbitrarily withdraw from their courses. In other words, if you didn't like chemistry uh, back then, well, you don't have to take it. If you didn't have to take math, don't take it. Well, they got out of school and gee, all of a sudden they wanted to be com um, engineers, chemical engineers or doctors, and of course the, the thousands of them went to schools for remedial uh, classes, so we have to be careful about that. Um, but hopefully the schools learn. But I feel we should not get too utopian till we know this works. And thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Barbara, for your thank comments. You. Thank you. We have Carrie next, and fol uh, followed by uh, Walter Bud Meadley. Carrie? Thank you. Uh, I'm Carrie Middleton. I'm a resident of Edina. I'm a taxpayer in Edina. Like everybody else, I'm concerned about property values. Um, I have two kids in the Edina. I have two kids, both of whom go to school at Valley View, a sixth grader and an eighth grader. My family moved to Edina more than a decade ago 
primarily because of the schools. The schools in this community really are the crown jewel in many ways of Edina. Um, our facilities are starting to show some serious age, all of them. I support the plan as proposed by the administration because it touches on every single facility in the district. Uh, it's time to do this. It will only cost more if we wait um, and do this later. If our facilities decline, then eventually the quality of, of the uh, education they provide will decline and that will affect all of us in a negative way. This plan has been thoroughly discussed and analyzed and considered. Uh, it's been in the works since 2009. I do think reasonable steps should be taken to address the concerns of the neighbors, the Creek Valley neighbors, but I'm confident that that will be accomplished. This plan is forward thinking, it's practical, and as I said, it impacts in a positive way every single school in the district. Um, I urge the board to, uh, to approve and vote yes on the proposal as laid out by the administration. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. Next up, we have Walter, uh, and Walter will be followed by Dick Ward. Welcome. Come on up. Yeah, the public won't be able to hear you uh, uh, on the uh, TV if they view the meeting later. Welcome. Any of these work? That work? There you go. Okay. All right. Well, let me, I'll say first of all, I commend the, the board. I thought your questions were penetrating and, and uh, worthy. Uh, I'll cut right to the chase here. I think the activity building, access to the, if access to the activity building cannot be done on existing school grounds, then it should not be done. Then it should be looked at for other locations. I'm a resident of what we call the Creek Valley of Spigots, which is west of the, of the uh, area that we're talking about there. The road extension into, into that as, as is proposed to the activity center uh, violates any number of things within our area. Primarily safety, uh, where all our kids walk to schools because they're all relatively close to all three schools. Uh, it creates additional hazards uh, for traffic uh, in, and uh, it creates value problems because all of our homes have a certain value because of the uh, relative uh, uh, placement against the school district. To open that road up would be a, a uh, real catastrophe from our standpoint. We represent, a cons a con I think, a uh, reasonable, consistent uh, 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 group of people we were at the meeting a week ago when information was provided to us. We appreciated the opportunity. I think we had 75 to 100 people there, all from that particular community. It does not seem appropriate to violate residential communities who have, that have been in existence for a considerable period of time to um, augment school facilities that at least could be arguably debated on the basis of both economics and feasibility and for what they add to the total, the total school proposition. Perhaps the activities could be done elsewhere. Uh, we, we brought that question up to the uh, folks uh, a week ago. Uh, they seem to think that was not a reasonable alternative. But it isn't reasonable to assume that that, that building, the activity center, uh, is, is so important as to violate the, the needs of residents surrounding it. And I, and I believe that's true of both sides of Creek Valley, both on the east and west. Appreciate the opportunity. Nice to be with you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Next up, we have Dick Ward, uh, followed by uh, Karen Deutsch. Good evening. Dick Ward, 6809 Galway Drive. Uh, I'm fortunate to have four of the five members of my family be graduates of Edina High School. If somebody's definition of the American dream is your family's doing better than you are, then I'm living it. I grew up in South Dakota, but my family's had the privilege of attending Edina High School. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in the facilities task force last fall. And really here tonight, I just wanted to comment and make sure that not only the board, but the community hears about this project and why it's not only important, but valuable for our 
public school system as well as our community going forward. So there's two kind of general themes that I see. Uh, first and foremost, Edina schools have a standard of excellence. I'm probably going to misquote some statistics here, but I think we graduate 95% of our students and approximately 90% of them graduate from college. And that's a result of the programs, the teaching staff, the administration, and now we're at the point where I think we need to refresh our facilities to continue that standard of excellence. The second point I'd like to make is um, you're not alone in this. I had the opportunity to look at uh, some other districts in the state and their efforts. I've got a listing here from the uh, School Board Association from last November. There were 48 bond referendums on the ballot. It was the most in a decade. Uh, and uh, the majority of them were for bond for capital projects and bond referendum for facilities. Waconia, 75 million. Uh, Robbinsdale, 35 million for technology. Centennial, 49 million for remodeling and enhancing safety. So this is an effort that is ongoing in our competitive set, in our market, in our environment. And I think it's very important that Edina take it on now uh, to keep us not only with that standard of excellence, but competitive in the uh, arena of the current arena of public education. Um, my last comment is yourself as board members and administrators and teaching staff should be thanked. Um, this is a rare opportunity to continue the excellence of Edina Public Schools, move it forward with a very valuable program. Uh, so with your leadership tonight and voting it forward, I know it's not difficult. It will be challenging to work out the rest of the details, but I think we're all up to it. And I hope my Edina grandchildren to go through these schools will have an opportunity to thank you also. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Dick. Uh, next up is Karen, uh, followed by Laurel Fishbach. Welcome, Karen. Hi, my name is Karen Deutsch. I have lived in the Edina community for 25 years. I have two kids, uh, one of which goes to Creek Valley Elementary, uh, one who goes to Valley View Middle School. We live in this neighboring area, and I would say that um, I hold down a corporate job. I take my kids to and from school. I have family that lives in the Midwest. I see a lot of other communities, and I have to say that, like Carrie Middleton, one of the reasons we moved here was for um, the the quality of the public schools. We I grew up going to a private school. We looked at the private schools here in the area, but we instead chose to um, participate in the public school system because it was so great. Having said all that, I would also say that now is the time to update um, and remain competitive, not just with STEM, not just with health and wellness, um, but our facilities as well, um, and the type of people that we want to uh, live and participate in this community. Um, secondarily, I would say that um, I wholeheartedly believe that all of it is a priority, uh, not just safety, not just the quality of the classroom, not just how uh, students learn today, the collaborative nature that this board and um, the school board has taken with the community, with teachers, with everybody in the neighboring areas, but students uh, need that collaborative nature as well. And then lastly, I would say in terms of the um, activities center, um, health and wellness is no joke. Um, and for the longevity of our kids uh, to be competitive with other communities, I believe that um, figuring out a way to access this community center, we can figure that out, but I do think it's all a priority for all of us that live here. Um, I would say that's it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Laurel, followed by Eric. Strobel. Hello, my name is Laurel Fishbach. I have one child at Normandale Elementary, and this is her last year there. Um, two things. One, I would like to say please go forward with um, upgrading our facilities. They are in desperate need. 
and it will do nothing but benefit everyone in the long run, including people that don't have children, thanks to our property values continuing to rise and Edina continuing to be one of the best places in the state of Minnesota to raise a family and have their children attend these schools. Fantastic plan. It will do nothing but raise the standards all the way around. The second thing I'd like to address, which I'm going to switch gears, is the calendar. Um, coming forward, we're going to work on two years now so that parents have lots of opportunity for planning for their family. I am on the calendar committee representing Normandale. We have a meeting on Tuesday, February 3rd. It would be extremely, extremely helpful if we could have from the board some guidelines. We want to know, moving forward, are we 100% for sure starting before Labor Day? Because we have to come up with dates. Are, do we have any parameters for when we need to end in June? Do we have the ability to do a random two-week vacation outside of spring break or Christmas? I have parents saying, well, if we're going to be doing uh, school before Labor Day, maybe we should have a get out of Minnesota winter break <laughs> in February or January. <laughs> um, things like that. Any kind of parameters, guidelines that you could give, give us to move forward um, quickly and easily because we're going to have a lot of work to do to try to come up with two calendars, two, year, two years um, back to back. And so I just want as much information as possible for you to give Gwen for us to move forward. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Eric, followed by uh, Marge Melvin. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. My, my name is Eric Strobel. I reside at 5840 Creek Valley Road. And uh, I appreciate all of the questions that you raised. And I think that those are the questions that the community has. And before digging in our pockets for $125 million, wouldn't it be nice to have an answer to those questions? Before we vote to spend the money, maybe we should find out what we're spending the money for. We, we've lived in the valley, in the shadow of Valley View Middle School and the high school for 15 years. The school, when it's not in session, our neighborhood is relatively quiet. When it is in session, not so much. We suffer significant burdens from our proximity to the high school. There are certainly benefit from living down the hill from the high school, but there are significant burdens. They, they range from the relatively mundane, like the high school cross-country team cutting through our, um, our backyards to shortcuts, because we have a long road and they want to cut off of eighth of a mile or whatever it is, to property damage caused by speeding cars losing control on our winding street. We put up with dumpsters being emptied at 4 o'clock in the morning with lights shining in our eyes all night, with booming music from the tennis courts in the summer, golf balls being driven from the high school parking lot into our neighborhood, hitting houses, breaking windows. We put up with abuse from the baseball coaches and players. And yes, I walk around and pick up condoms, broken pot pipes, and empty beer bottles left behind by your students. In short, we're good neighbors. We do this because we love our neighborhood and because we value the education offered by the Edina Public Schools. We have trusted that the school board is trying to do the right thing. I'm not so sure this time. As with most facilities assessment, the school board appointed a facility task force in August of 2014. We've got a little bit about that. You asked the task force to consider school needs, make recommendations for funding those needs. That group carefully considered a wide variety of options. The funding proposals spent many hours in meetings and observations. In October, the task force submitted a report to you. The task force, not surprisingly, supported most of the school's requests for additional help with security, with repairs, with maintenance, with new equipment, new 
desks, and on and on and on. The one thing that the task force rejected was your request for a community activity center in our residential neighborhood. Like a good advisory panel, the task force didn't say no. They just asked you to pause. Just pause. Task force recommended the school board undertake additional study of the environmental impacts, the neighborhood impacts, and the impact on the broader community. You have not done that. Superintendent Bresson on Tuesday confirmed that you have not done that. All of your questions you raised tonight show that you have not done that. Do the study that the task force has suggested. There is no reason to ram forward a request for $125 million for a project that might not be able to be built. Your plan to fund first and ask questions later sounds like Congress. I don't know which one of you wants to be Nancy Pelosi, but you remember. We have to pass it to find out what's in the bill. That's nonsense. That is nonsense. Every one of your questions deserves to be asked before you are asked to ask me for $125 million. And every one of my questions deserves to be answered before you ask me to spend $125 million on a dream without a plan. Every year, let's talk about some of the facts. Uh, Eric, your, your time's up. You, can you wrap it up in about 30 seconds? Sure. I just want to talk about Mr. Burfin for briefly. Your APES professor, Adva Ad Advanced Placement Environmental Studies. Every year he trots down to the lower field and he does soil borings. He started that when the softball field kept sinking into the, into the uh, wetlands and before they put in the pond. What he does is he drills down to find out how close the wetland is to the high school. And his purpose is to show that we have this beautiful outdoor learning facility right in our backyard. We have a wetland that the environmental students can study. Your plan, the Next Generation Plan, touts these outdoor classrooms. But you want to take the most beautiful outdoor classroom in the area and you want to fill it with concrete and asphalt. How about we just leave the outdoor facility we've got and figure out another plan? Thank you. Yes, sir. Marge is the last individual who I have down who's asked to speak this evening. Welcome. I'm Marge Melvin and I have lived in Edina for 46 years and I'd like to share a little bit of my educational background with you. I did my student teaching in St. Louis Park and from there I was offered five jobs in the metro, uh, but I went on to grad school instead and taught for a year at Moundsview and St. Paul uh, while doing grad school and then came back here and taught 30 years at Southview. And so I'd like to share with you some of the perspectives that I have. And then after doing all of that, I have been over to Thailand and have done some teaching over there. And let me tell you that those classrooms are not fantastically beautiful or anything. But the parents are so committed, the kids are so committed, the kids all read, write, and speak Thai, Chinese, and English. And frankly, you know, so many of our kids still have problems with English, uh, as do newspaper writers, um, broadcasters, and so on. Um, and so within this, I just want to stress the idea that money can't buy education, and it's really not the facilities. Uh, I was honored twice and listed in Who's Who Among America's Teachers here in Edina. Um, I loved teaching, I loved the kids and everything else. And there is no difference that a classroom would have made uh, in coming up with creative ideas, loving these kids, doing everything I did with them. Um, and I don't regret a moment, I just really loved it. And so I want to stress that. Oftentimes when we got budgets and things, it's like either use it or you lose it. And so people would order things because, well, you've got the money, you might as well spend it. And I guess at this point, too, it's like, let's pull back. Um, Edina, you know, has that acronym, every day I need attention. Um, our kids are wonderful, but um, some, you know, can get too far away. And as he was mentioning some of the problems uh, that he had in his outdoor area, we had some problems when we opened up that new wing at Southfield. And uh, they came in trashing the restrooms and the lockers and whatnot. And so they don't always appreciate the new things. But I think just appreciating what they have and having that attitude and the respect uh, that goes along with it. Also, a few comments about eighth grade and ninth grade. Eighth grade is the hardest year in the world to teach 
they don't really love themselves, they're changing physically and everything else, and they're very critical of themselves and everyone else. Ninth graders are so stable, and they become such wonderful leaders in that setting. You take them now out of the Southview, for example, background, put them in the high school, suddenly they're at the bottom of the totem pole again, and they never have that chance to exert the leadership uh, which they have uh, when they're in that position. So I think it's a real mistake uh, to take them out. I know many schools around have done that, but I think it's been to our benefit that we've kept them in the middle school and let them be the leaders. So um, I, I just want to say, um, value education for education, and I don't think it's the building at all, um, but it's the teachers. Get the very best teachers you can, support them, uh, do whatever you can to help them through. Teachers are burning out in five years or so now in many cases. It's a tough job, and it's getting tougher all along. So if parents and students will you know, work hard uh, to make the most of their education, we can have super students all the time. Um, Edina is wonderful, and I've enjoyed uh, teaching here. And I actually do miss it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank, Thank you all. We appreciate your uh, input and value. Uh, next up, we're off to our. Did, did we miss anybody, by the way? Anybody else that wanted to speak that didn't have a chance? Didn't hand in? Okay. Uh, next up, we're off to our consent agenda. Can I have a motion to bring that to the floor and then have Rick review it? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to approve our consent agenda this evening. Rick, Rick could you please walk us through that? Certainly can. Uh, again, we uh, reaffirm, and these are all organizational consent agenda items. They're agenda items that the board takes action at its first organizational meeting, which is tonight. Uh, one is a f uh, reaffirming all the district policies that we currently have in place. Also, the annual board compensation of $2,400 per year. Uh, the depositories that we have uh, with the Edina Public Schools include U.S. Bank, Minnesota School District Liquid Asset Fund, Minnesota Trust Fund, PMA Financial Network, PMA Securities, and Smith Barney. Those will all be our official depositories for 2015. Um, when we're looking at uh, data co compliance, uh, we've identified officials through that. There are administrators within the district. The district officials' uh, newspaper is the Sun Current. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Let's try that again. Uh, the, from the consent agenda, uh, we're reaffirming district policies. The board compensation is $2,400 per year. Uh, the district depositories are staying the same as they were in 2014. Uh, we do have uh, identified compliance officials. They are administrators within the district. The district's officials, uh, newspapers, the Sun Current. Our checking account uh, signatures have been identified, again, through the business office. We have uh, signatures for the Edina Kids Club, which is a petty cash account the board's required to approve. Uh, we're also making authorization for electronic fund transfers, as well as authority for the uh, pay of claims prior to school board approval to align up with our school district's, uh, our school board's uh, regular meetings. Uh, we approve the credit cards as assigned. Our legal counsel includes um, uh, Rupp, Anderson, Squires, uh, Dorsey, and Whitney, Knutson, Flynn, and Deans, Ratwick, Rozak, and Maloney, the Brand Law Firm, and Dennis O'Brien Law Firm all serve in 2015 legal counsel for us. Our district architect will be Wold Architect, and um, uh, <coughs> um, auditors are, Margo, remind me. MMKR. MMKR. And uh, we also are seeking a student not te teaching agreement, rather a student nursing agreement with the University of Massachusetts, Boston. We do have a placement for a, a student a nurse at, uh, within the district. And then the personnel recommendations. And finally, expenditures for January 12th. And that would conclude the organizational consent agenda as, as well as the routine items for the board. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dressen. Uh, any items that anybody would like removed from the consent agenda? Are there any questions regarding the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up, we have our first action item this evening, uh, the uh, next-gen facilities, uh, the concept proposal, and the referendum authorization. Uh, can you get a motion, please? So moved. Second. It's 
been moved and second uh, to approve the next gen facilities concept proposal as a framework for the district's May 2015 bond referendum. We have a, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion, Randy, questions, comments? Randy, could you just uh, clarify, we have two things on our agenda, the concept proposal and then the referendum authorization, or, um, or maybe Dr. Dressen they're could. They're gonna be two separate <laughs> motions. Right, but just the difference between the two, if okay. you can articulate. Uh, sure, uh, Ms. Petzloff, the uh, concept plan is what we were talking about earlier this evening. The uh, resolution to authorize a special election is their legal, legal duty to then actually put in motion all the election calendar and the voting places and things like that. Thank you. The ballot language. Thanks for asking that question. Any other questions? Uh, we obviously had our discussion earlier. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, thoughts? Seeing none, all those in favor of pr uh, approving the next gen facilities uh, concept proposal, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Uh, next item is the uh, referendum authorization for our. Uh, not getting to the right page here. Let me make sure. Approve the uh, resolution calling for a special election on May 5th, 2015. The special election will consist of one question seeking voter approval of bond referendum authority in the amount of $124,900,000 payable over 20 years. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Uh, again, we had the presentation this evening. Any discussion, questions, comments? I guess I'd like to say, Sorry, you know, no based on everything that we've discussed and heard tonight, um, I do feel strongly about keeping the discussion open around a priority list and looking at that in a circular motion as we continue to move forward. Um, you know, costs change, budgets can go over. And so I just want to make sure that there's always a discussion, um, not only with the board, but with the, with the community about how this is all proceeding forward. And I guess because I, d I too agree somewhat with, with what my, some of my colleagues have said tonight that, you know, there are things that I think are more immediate needs versus um, needs that I think can wait in terms of time. Um, but finally, I guess I'd like to say that ultimately this issue, in my opinion, is up to the people. And although tonight there are seven school board members that will vote one way or another to move this recommendation forward and ask the, our, our residents of district, school district 273 to vote on a referendum in May that's worth $125 million, that after today, we are but each one vote, as is all of our constituents. And I hope that the residents take the time to become informed and engage in the process, whether it's becoming more informed about the scope of the proposal, the cost of each component of that proposal, and then the tax impact that their individual household will feel from this, and also looking at the future of our schools. And that with that knowledge, that we will hopefully in May have a high voter turnout for this election, so that this referendum in the end is what the people want and what our constituents want. Because after tonight, we too are just one vote. Thank you, sir. Additional questions, comments, thoughts? I, I would just quickly add uh, two, two things. Uh, first, while the future is always uncertain and we do need to worry about contingency and changes, a lot of work has gone into this proposal and I at least go into this believing that we are uh, authorizing an amount of money that will accomplish everything that we're looking to accomplish and do it with a tremendous standard of excellence. And I'm personally very excited uh, about this proposal, and uh, I think it's going to be a great thing for this district. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, I certainly echo Sarah's remarks about an involved community, but do also want to point out that this board has spent the last year immersed in this, uh, attending to details, uh, probably devoting more time than most of you are going to be willing to, uh, to contribute to this. And uh, I vote for this with an absolute certainty that it's the right thing for this district 
and the right thing for our community. And I hope uh, folks will join us in doing in, in doing this project. Thanks. Thanks, David. Additional questions, comments? Uh, I think it's also important to note that this is not approving the resolution. Okay. I think it's important to note as well that approving the resolution tonight for the referendum isn't the end of a discussion. It is still part of the discussion. And over the last two years, we've done our birth to grade five study. We've done our um, you know, six to 12 year study. And we've been looking at everything that we need. And this is at this point of our discussion saying, this is how far we've gotten. This is where we know we need to go. But as we've talked about, it's only so far. And there are more discussions for both the board and the community to have. And so I invite everyone to continue in those discussions with us. And the only other thing I would add is um, we're not doing away with traditional education. Um, that has served us very well. It served most of our, our students very well. It served us all well in other <laughs> places, not necessarily here. But um, but what we are, there are people, there are students that are not being served with the traditional model. And we do have a gap. And there are kids that are struggling and need different access to different ways of learning. And so this what we're looking for is how to enhance what we had and to move forward so that we're really reaching all the kids in our district. I don't have a lot of details to add to that. I do agree with the comments that have been made so far, so I'll just say a ditto to all of that. I believe that this will help us close the gap. It will help us meet the needs of all learners. And it's the beginning of a next step in the partnership that we have with our community. That's what our mission is about. This is the mission that we've had in place for decades. It served us well to accomplish the level of excellence that has been achieved so far. But as has been stated well by many of our speakers this evening, there does need to be some flexibility and change to meet the changing needs of learners. It's not the same as when each of us was in school. It's not necessarily the same as what our current set of K-12 learners need. We're designing the support structure for education for a next generation of learners, which is the title of the studies we've been conducting. So it's supporting what we've had, good custodianship of our facilities, which are solid facilities, but they do need maintenance. They do need <coughs> some care and support every you know, 10 to 20 years. Some have not been touched in more than a decade. So I do thank the community for their support on this and just acknowledge that this is a partnership and continued dialogue that is moving forward. Uh, what we are voting on this evening is to allow the question to come before the public so that they can join the school board in the research that we've been conducting with the administration and with the staff and students. So I do thank the community for their support. Thanks, Regina. Sure. I'll be brief. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked a lot of questions the last few months, and the person next to me might say I've asked too many. Uh, but I am comfortable and satisfied that the district has done a good job in analyzing the needs and putting up a proposal that will meet those needs. I'm comfortable that we're going to continue to listen to what people in the public say, whether it's safety about our kids in the neighborhoods or needs for facilities. So I would encourage people, again, to be involved in the process do give us feedback. We do listen, and we do react to that feedback, and we thank you for it. Thank you, Lenny. Any additional questions or comments? Again, we're approving a resolution calling for a special uh, election on May 5th, 2015. The special election will consist of one question, seeking voter approval of a bond referendum authority in the amount of 124900000 payable over 20 years. All those in favor of this motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And thank you all, and thank the administration for the tremendous workload you've taken on the past uh, 12 months trying to pull this together. Uh, next up, we have our 2015-2016 early childhood through grade 12 school calendar. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to approve our calendar, uh, which has been the work of the calendar committee and also gone through a number of other steps along the way. Uh, can I get any discussion, feedback? Uh, Gwen, are you happy to put one to, to, to a bed again, huh? I'd and get started next week on the next <laughs> one? I'd be happy to share just a little bit about the calendar. Um, first of all, I want to thank the 13 
committee members who served on the committee on the calendar committee was um, parents, teachers, and administrators. And one of the things that we did was looked at almost 90, 1,900 pieces of information from a survey that was completed back in October and um, gave us some good feedback in terms of what is preferred and what, what is not preferred on calendars. And one of the things we quickly found out is that there is no perfect calendar for everyone. But we tried our best to um, stay within the framework that we had and, and come up with, we came up with two calendars to present to the staff. They voted on one and the one that um, had the preference is in front of you this evening. And one of the um, points that we have heard from community members recently is the concern about two days at the end of the school year. And that's something that we're certainly going to consider when our committee meets in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we appreciate continuing to get feedback and we put that in the mix for the next calendar that we will be creating. So with that, I will see if there are any questions. Questions? So yes. This is the same. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to turn on the microphone. This is the same calendar we saw last at our last meeting in December, correct? It is the same calendar, yes. Okay, thank you. So, when, oh, so there's well. no opportunity to address the concerns of families who don't like those two days in June for the next year. That's what I'm wondering. Um, that is what we will be looking at for the 2016 to hopefully 2018 calendar. So not, th uh, I'm asking about the current one before us. Yes, we, that is the one that is pre before us right now. So that's a board decision. Okay, so I think what Lisa was trying to clarify is, and you said when you were going to talk to the committee about it, you don't mean for this current calendar that no, we're approving is, tonight. Thank you. It is, yes. it is for the future. Because for the future. Because each time we continue to look at other aspects of the calendar um, to keep improving it yes. for the next round. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to probably be a broken record here, but um, I still have concerns around this calendar, and I'd like to just again share that now that I've seen both the proposals that went to staff, um, again in my own analysis, there were there were major changes between th or differences between these two calendars that are f far bigger than June 6th and 7th, and I I think that. My guess is the, the reason one over the other, and it being a 54, 46% vote, I don't think is necessarily strong, but the, the staff did decide one over the other. And um, th some of the big differences were a three-day Thanksgiving break, break versus a five-day Thanksgiving break, a week earlier spring break versus the one that's currently be being proposed, and other variations, including even when the semester ends. Um, I continue to hear from, from people who've taken the time to actually look at the whole calendar, because we have to bear in mind that a lot of our constituents are probably looking at this and going, okay, are we starting before Labor Day? Yes, we are. Okay, I, did I have my week at Thanksgiving and this and that? And they breeze through it. And I'm concerned that we are going to get very strong feedback from our residents when the calendar is finally published and whether they notice this for the first time in August or next week, that when they see this Monday and Tuesday, June 6th, there is a huge question around why are we doing this? And one of the things that we've just talked about when we say that it's, that there are benefits to starting before Labor Day is front loading those days before testing. And we do have an opportunity to do this, I think, in reviewing this calendar and ending on June 3rd by removing a couple of the d days off whether they're that fr give this Friday now before Labor Day off or spring break or the March date. I mean, I, th I really do feel that we could find flexibility in this calendar and end on June 3rd and give those two days prior to important testing periods back to the calendar where I think they do more benefit than June 6th and 7th. I know that you we've talked about other things. Um, in terms of potentially end of year testing and finals and stuff that this could benefit some students. But I think overall it goes against some of the rationale that we've given for starting before Labor Day. And I don't, my gut tells me this isn't necessarily why the staff voted for one over the other. Also, I did have the opportunity just to ask a few elementary teachers about it. And granted, it's just elementary, and it's different for our staff that are working with middle school students and high school students who have much more pressure at the end of the year on finals. But they found those 
they predicted those two days would not be very successful with their younger age students. So again, I would encourage that we reconsider at least these two days and look at m making a minor change, although the staff did vote on this, I think it's a minor change that could bring a happy medium and a better result for our community in terms of our students and our parents and their calendars. I would agree with that. Those, those two days still bother me um, at the end of it, dovetailing out there. And it, it, I do struggle with that because it does go against all the other supporting information or, or reasoning for the pre-Labor Day start for me. And so, you know, we, we talked about this before in previous board meetings that, you know, we look at the pre-Labor Day because of the construction and we can do that, but we want to make sure that no matter what we start before Labor Day, it is still supporting our academic needs of our students. And I just feel that for all the reasons Sarah said, I also agree that those two days, I have a hard time reconciling starting before Labor Day and then going into the second week of June. I appreciate the questions that Sarah's raised and, I, and they're good questions or some of the questions that we've had in email as well. Mm -hmm. I also respect the fact that the staff has voted on this and I do respect where the staff is coming from recognizing this is not an overwhelming majority but there is a majority. Gwen, I, I know that you probably didn't have a detailed result as to why the staff preferred one or the other but given the calendar committee's discussion about the two different versions is there anything that you can speak to that might give us some light on the calendar that landed before us what are some of the advantages of it that we might be missing well um, some of the advantages are we had to look at when um, some of our high school students are going away to college to do college visits so we wanted to look at that throughout the calendar. We also wanted to look at some of the, um, of when the semester would end. We also wanted to look at the high school program. Um, it, as part of our discussion, semester there was discussion yeah. about the May term and if that would be in place or not in place and what did that look like. And then the other thing was that we did talk about um, two-day weeks and what does that look like and the feeling was that a two-day week in um, November feels very different than a two-day week in June so those were some of the discussions that we had it um, it it I can't speak to why staff voted for one over the other because that wasn't part of the survey that wasn't part of the, the ballot So I, I, I have two thoughts. Calendars are never easy, particularly when they, some of the holidays fall on funny days of the week or times of the year. And uh, we could table this. Um, my only concern about that is we're pushing this thing way back. My suggestion is we pass it and we ask administration to look at, do they have a possible fix for this two-day June week? as an alternative because it seems like that's 90 percent of the concerns we're hearing um I, I i'm disappointed we can't split the semesters but i know the calendar structure doesn't facilitate that um but i'm also concerned with parents that many of them plan their spring breaks uh, 18 months ahead and we we're still hanging on to this thing so it's for that reason i'm suggesting we uh pass it, but ask administration to look at are there alternatives for these uh, two-day two day week in, uh, in the second week of June? Thoughts? I, I would agree with those comments. Um, I would say personal, I, well first I would say the committee has worked very hard to satisfy everyone and not surprisingly has perhaps not satisfied anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the hazards of being on a committee like that, but but it was a valiant effort. Um, my primary concern was we started before Labor Day to make sure that we were done early to facilitate construction. And I've had you know some conversations, which you know perhaps Rick can address here. But my understanding is we are still ending earlier than neighboring schools, and we're still able to 
enjoy that advantage. And to me, that's a prerequisite to approving the calendar. If we weren't doing that, then we haven't followed the guidance that came from the board, and I couldn't vote for it. But my understanding is, and I'd ask Rick when I'm finished chattering, to uh, confirm that. That said, I, I don't think the board has given the committee as clear a guidance as we should have. I, I would take some of the blame on us. And I think going forward for the next school year calendar, we've got to do better, and we need to explore a process that, that gets this done better and earlier. But given that it's January, I don't see, given, given that it's January, given all the committee's work, and given that staff has approved it, I don't see an opportunity for changing anything unless staff were to come to us and say, we're fine with this, this would make it better for everybody, um, then I'd be very happy, but I don't see that happening. So Rick, maybe you could just address that, that point about the end of the year, or, or Gwen. Sure, I, I was just gonna say, there. Are, we looked at several, or I've looked at several calendars where the school district is um, starting after Labor Day, and um, there are some districts that are ending around June 10th, but when I looked at the calendar closely, it is because they have um, one and a half weeks at winter break. And when we looked at the survey information, there was overwhelming response that no, we do want two weeks at winter break time. Um, some of the other calendars have ba basically no spring break. They have, my, um, from what I could tell, even one or two days, if that much, in order to get out June 10th. So if we kept the two weeks at winter break, one week at spring break, which is how the, the response from the survey came back, um, it really is the middle of June when we would be getting out of school. So we did take that into consideration, uh, the calendar committee. And I thank you for, um, David, for expressing the hard work of the calendar committee, and we did our job because nobody is satisfied. So okay. <laughs> that's right. Just, just like a is. good settlement. <laughs> 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 so um, I share the concerns raised about the two days, and in part it's driven by the first Friday off after four days of school, and then the Friday added to spring break. So my question is, given the reservations that are expressed, and it's not necessarily by a majority, but does the administration still recommend this calendar as opposed to one which could eliminate those two days? And then if so, why do they, what's the recommendation based on? Uh, that is the recommendation that is coming before um, the board, and that is the recommendation that the committee put in front, one of the recommendations or one of the options that the committee put in front of the staff, and that is what the staff selected as opposed to the other option. So that's all that I have at this particular time. Maybe Dr. Dressen, you have something else? Yeah, I mean, I think it's honoring the process, as, as David articulated, is, uh, you know, again, trying to stay within the board guidelines and uh, honoring the, the process of the task force work and the detail that they had done and the vote process. Uh, that being said, uh, as we look forward, I think there are some things we can look at differently. But, um, but again, uh, it's, it's a rich discussion to have here tonight. I think it's an important one, so. Well, and I, I guess I'd like to add, in terms of the process, I think it's something we need to reconsider as we move forward. Um, I'd understand that it's a difficult process for the calendar committee to, to sift through and try to make a minimum of two calendars. When if the committee could have the charge of we are going to make the best calendar possible, there could be one committee, or one calendar that comes out of this committee and it goes to the school board to approve. Um, I, I think that a process where, from what I understand, you know, say there's 10 things that they think are the greatest things that they'd like to see in a calendar, but they're having to parse them across two different calendars so that those two calendars can be the ones presented to staff to vote on makes neither one necessarily the best choice possible of the best way to put together our school year. And there I could list many other things that I saw in option one that I think are su more superior and fit more of the needs of the things that we've been addressing about our calendar. So I guess what my point is around finding a simple compromise is saying let's find a simple compromise around these couple of days. I think we've mentioned two days that seem easy enough to pull out of the calendar so that we can end on June 3rd. And then in the future, I would recommend that this board discusses the process 
of the concept of a calendar committee and what comes out of that calendar committee and what type of voting goes on anymore on our calendar. I'm not a fan of the two hanging Chad days in June either. <laughs> The issue right now, though, is we need to approve a calendar for this next school year, and we need to get it done. Because even the days that you're saying, well, we could take a day out of um, the Friday before spring break or the Friday before Labor Day, people are going to ma start making their vacations. They're going to book travel, and we just can't say, well, we're going to think about those two days, and we'll study it for another month, or we'll study it for another six weeks, and then we'll let you know when those, um, those vacations are going to be. I have... I don't like those two last days, but I think we do need to, for the sake of people who need to plan their lives, we need to approve a calendar. Well, I guess I would recommend then a friendly amendment that I would we agree. recommend this minor change to the calendar. That's that I would be more comfortable with that. I, I don't Without need two weeks. delaying it, you know, recommending that tonight. It may, there may only be one person who would vote for that friendly amendment, and then that, that's the decision of the board. So, so, so point of clarity, are, are you suggesting that you're going to come up with the days you would change now, or are you, su you suggesting that we'd request administration come back with it with some options? Well, I mean, in looking in the in the calendar that, that was proposed, it was obvious, it, it seemed obvious to me that if you didn't have the first Friday off, which is September 4th, so it's the Friday before Labor Day, and then instead of having a six-day spring break, we have a, the traditional five-day spring break and remove the Friday before spring break from the calendar, then we can end on June 3rd, both days being before important testing and both offering one in each semester additional days of classroom time. So to me, it seems like a very simple and fair compromise not messing overall with when spring break takes place. It's in the traditional time frame. Also having the traditional five-day Thanksgiving break. Some of the bigger differences that were in option one, that was not approved by staff. So the, we'd have a Friday, we'd start school on a Friday? No, no, it's, it's starting on Monday. It's mm -hmm. just instead of going to school for five days the week before Labor Day, we're going to school four days. Oh, start on the 31st. We yeah, always we were. Are, we, are the we are starting the 31st. But right now we show that the first Friday is a vacation. Is a vacation day. before Labor Day. It's a four day yeah. weekend. For everyone, staff included, as well as the Friday before spring break. Is a so, vacation school, day. so the, modifi the, the proposed amendment uh, is uh, to hold classes on both September 4th and March 25th, which we eliminate June 6th and 7th as days that school is being held. Right, and they were days off. They weren't in-service days, so we're not affecting our teachers' uh, uh, Special. continued education. They are days that were full off for both student and staff. If I'm right, and I'm not sure I'm Googling fast enough, but March 25th is Good Friday? We had Next concern, year? Yeah, we in this uh, 2016. And I think there was some concern expressed to the board that school was in session on Good Friday this past school year, which we've had, the school district has gone both ways, I believe, on that. And I know that it won't necessarily Our spring break is like not ever based, though, on any of the religious holidays. It has traditionally been based on, it is the last week slash first, last week of April slash first. No, March. last week of March slash first week of April. So again, I don't believe that the day was given off for the purpose of Good Friday from the calendar committee. Right. And we'd actually be taking it No, I know that back. It's good Friday. It, it is Good Friday. And I know that that's, there's not a board mandate to honor it or not. It's just another level of concern that was expressed to the board with a request Well, the to concern honor. was that we shouldn't be honoring it. If you read We've the email that you're referencing. Oh, no, no, not that. I'm not referencing an email from this winter. Oh, oh, sorry. No, no, it's that I understand. No, that one I, that I got that one too. Yeah, <laughs> I, got, I got. I have a, I have a collection. <laughs> and oh, just trying to balance the different concerns that were expressed. We have concern, concern expressed on both sides, but honoring, you know, I just I recognize that we've had right. family concern about that. Um, I hear and September fourth. I speak to the committee if they specifically chose I don't know. to take Good Friday off. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That would be my friendly amendment, whether it would pass or not is 
not for, up for me to say, but that would be what I would recommend. Is there a second? I would second that. Uh, so we have an amendment on the, on the table. Uh, Gwen, uh, any thoughts? We are here to get a calendar completed so that families can <laughs> keep moving <laughs> forward. Um, I agree with that statement. And uh, one of the concerns that I do have is that I believe that reservations have been made for the location for graduation. And um, the graduation, I believe, um, is um, on June 8th at this particular time. So I will connect, if, if this passes, I will connect what with Jenny. stop? Excuse me? I, so if it passes, um, I will connect with Jenny Johnson right away to see if there is a possibility of getting that changed. Or oh, you mean making it earlier, closer to actual last day of school? If, well, if it is possible, but it's very difficult to find location and um, time for graduation for us, so, but we can try. This would change I don't understand. But, but why does it why change commencement? It We'd be getting out on June 3rd versus June 7th with commencement of being on of June 8th. Oftentimes, commencement is usually close to the time when students are out of school, oh. as opposed to several days later. That's all I was yeah. saying. I understand that concern. I. I, I'm not sure that would be that that would direct me not to 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 go ahead with that amendment because that's one one grade out of twelve, and so you know it's not something not to consider, but I have to balance it against the other eleven grades. I just had to express my concern about changing the process at this point. I agree that there are many things about the calendar that was not brought before us that I do prefer. You know, and that when I look at the, my own experience with kids going through the system and um, some other issues that have been expressed to us, I see the advantages of that. However, I am hesitant to change the process on the spur of the moment at this point that calls into question the work of the calendar committee and the staff approval. I wonder to what point they have gone through their process if the board decides that it would rather create the calendar on its own at the last minute. I hear the concerns. I'm not disagreeing with the concerns, and I agree with David's point and with Laurel's request that the parameters be clear and set early on for the next two years. But I have reservation about doing something that alters the process that to which we have agreed and to which several groups have already committed a great deal of time working in that direction. Understand. And, and I would join in, I'd go further than Regine and say I actively dislike the proposed calendar, but I do think we have an obligation to honor the process. I, I disliked it enough to make me pull out the guiding change document mm -hmm. uh, before the meeting, and it's been followed. I mean, the board gave this committee guidelines, and they have met them, and I just, uh, you know, we, we empowered them, we told the staff they were voting on something, and I have a great deal of trouble going back to our teachers and, and to this committee and saying, you did all your hard work and you voted, but we're going to overrule you. I the, would the not be willing to do that. The only thing I remember vividly, and we had this discussion in a meeting, and I think Lenny brought it up, was that when we, when we vote on a guiding change document, does that mean whatever happens is set in stone? And I remember the response being no, not necessarily. And so I think that we've always had this discomfort with this guiding change document because you know it, even if you follow the rules and we end up with a solution that it sounds like many of us are uncomfortable it, just because the process was followed and we end up with a decision that maybe no one's happy with does that why would we vote for something we're not happy with and so I, I struggle with it I mean the I know everybody's met and you have a thousand things to juggle in this calendar it's it's daunting um, right. and, and I would say I want to express that I do appreciate the process and I understand, you know, it is an 8% point difference of staff that would prefer the current calendar of the two options that they look at and I understand that I could be treading into territory that will not make me any friends. But I'm looking at our constituents and what seems to me to make more sense and I would also say then if ultimately the calendar that is presented to the board 
because of the process cannot be changed, then I'm not quite sure why I'm voting on the calendar. Because what you're telling me is that this is the process, you get a choice of a calendar, and ultimately I can have no input in that choice that is presented to the board. So I would just put that back. But I understand that this is a process that has gone on for several years, and I don't want it to come across as though I don't value that this is the process that was put in place. And that's why I'm not saying let's scrap option two for the original, for the other option one. I'm saying let's find a happy compromise within this that I feel will better fit the needs of our students and families. So my question is, there, there's now potentially two different calendars. There's the friendly amendment proposed, and then there's the one that administration proposed prior to the friendly amendment. The goal of the calendar is to have a calendar that, that maximizes the academic achievement of our students. Mm -hmm. So I go back to administration because we can all sit here and we're not educators. We rely upon the advice. And so my question to his administration is Rob, between the two calendars, the friendly amendment and the one, what are the pros and cons in terms of what, of our, what our objectives are? You know, that's a hard question for me to answer. Um, I, I can only talk about the pros and cons of the calendar that we brought forward. I, I can't necessarily speak to the um, proposed plan that you are discussing at this particular time, um, except for the fact that, yes, school does get out prior, you know, gets out two days earlier, um, and that is you know, that is also a good thing as well. I, I'm not sure how to respond to your question. Because I, it, it isn't, I, I'm not the committee, there are several of us on the committee. And so it's hard for me to speak on behalf of everybody. And, and the question isn't necessarily directed towards you, and, and not to put the person sitting behind you, but we have a director of teaching and learning and perhaps he's <laughs> got <laughs> We have. Well, thank you. I tried to give the yeah, I I microphone to you. Yeah. You were blocking them for a <laughs> while there, but you know, <laughs> perhaps because we've talked about is a four-day work week, four-day school day, four-day school week as good as a five-day, is a two-day as good as classes in June as good as in May. Yeah. Um, do we want to stop and start? So I'm just looking for something that that sort of gives me some guidance here because I appreciate the concerns about following the process and that I, I lean that way, but I have to judge based upon what makes sense in terms of our mission. Okay. And, and Gwen's correct in, in saying that we were fighting over the <laughs> mic on who's talking here. Um, I would say that as we talk through this as a committee, certainly having continuity in our learning weeks is really critical. Certainly front-end loading as many learning days ahead of assessments as possible is critical and gives students advantages. Um, but as we look at all of the fact, and, and everybody in this room understands the complexity of trying to create a calendar, so I won't go through that, but trying to create um, opportunities where you have your, you're honoring the breaks that people have requested so people can get refreshed um, and doing that at the holiday time and in the springtime and trying to honor many of those different kinds of parameters, these were the two options that the committee proposed. And there was a lot of discussion that occurred around those. There was a lot of discussion that occurred with staff. Um, and at one point we went back and re-voted on some other options because the days were out of balance between the two semesters as, as staff had reported back that it was too much of uh, a lack of balance. And so in the end, after all the dialogue, these were the two calendars that were proposed. And certainly, again, getting as many learning days in front of assessments as possible is important. Also having continuity in those learning days is really important from a teaching standpoint. Um, to have five days to be able to continue and, and get your flow as an educator with the students is really critical. Uh, but again, in the end, this was the dialogue and the uh, discussion in the committee and it was brought to staff and, and board previously. And so this is where we're at. 
Thanks, Randy. Uh, so what we do have at this point is an amendment on the table to uh, modify, to adjust for the two days in June. Oh. Here. Oh. Well, can I, could I make one more comment or question before we go on to that? Go ahead. Certainly. <laughs> okay. Well, you can say yes, but Randy may not. Randy needs to, um, sorry. <laughs> just while, while Lenny was asking questions, you know, to staff, it, it occurred to me, and, and you're certainly free to, to not answer, but Rob, you're sitting there in the back, and mm -hmm. certainly one of my concerns is honoring the staff vote. Right. Do, do you have any thoughts as to, uh, you know, how the board should think about this issue? Might as well be on the hot seat, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you wanted to be president. <laughs> Rob Gardner, uh, I think it's from Dinah. Um, I think you've identified all the factors, and you know the trick is, I think when it comes to a vote for the faculty and for all staff, that it's it's a holistic vote. You can't pick and choose the elements that you like, and so I, I know in conversation with the uh, first set of calendars that were proposed and then were pulled back because of the semester dates, and then again uh, with these calendars, uh, you know all of the de the debate that you're putting out there are the kinds of things our members were saying, but the it really does become split depending on what issue you're looking at. And I think also what level you teach at, that the uh, consequences of any calendar are going to change significantly depending if you're high school, middle school, or elementary, or even our early childhood colleagues. And so uh, there's no easy decision here. I don't envy you uh, in making a decision, but I do think that you've identified all of the problems and the need for a process going forward that addresses a lot of these parameters ahead of, the ahead of time. So. There's your non-answer, David. Sorry. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> diplomatic. Thank you, Rob. I, Rob, if I could ask you one more, I think I think the concern, with all sincerity, is that we would not want to upset any group, whether it's EME or any of the other staff groups, um, by adding a friendly amendment. Would that feel as though? we have crossed a line in terms of when we ask for your opinion on the calendar? Good question. I, I do think our members understand that any vote that we do is advisory, uh, that that's not a, a lock-in for what the school board will do. At just thinking in the back of the room as you've been having your conversation, I know at other points in the past we've uh, taken positions in a calendar vote and then the board for a variety of reasons has had to change that calendar. Uh, you know, we've got to communicate to our members that it's advisory in nature and that we have no say over the calendar in terms of what it finally is. I'd love to have that and we can put that on our negotiations list, but <laughs> uh, until that happens, we, uh, we understand that that's part of the trick. You know, I think it might be helpful for the board to know, and I don't know, if Gwen, if you have this information in terms of how many people voted mm -hmm. on the calendar options, which might give another layer of perspective to uh, the vote that took place. Thanks, Rob. So Does he have that information? <laughs> I can't remember. There were almost 200, um, 200 faculty who voted on the calendar. Out of? We have about 650. So a third uh, okay. voted? Okay. It's almost nine, and I know we're still supposed to have a work session, so... Um, I think everybody has obviously made their point. So I would, I would offer two options here. One, we can table with the consequence of that's two more weeks when we meet again, but it would give staff or any other questions to be discussed further. Or I'm more than to leave my friendly amendment on the table and let, it, let the chips fall where they may. Um, I just, I, if, if I would sense that the administration especially or, or ran our chair would prefer that we let this uh, wait another two weeks, I am, I am comfortable with removing my um, friendly amendment and asking it to be tabled. Yeah, my suggestion would be to table just because there's been so much thought put into this that I don't want to change something and then come back in two weeks and have to change it a second time because we overlooked something. Uh, that is a factor that we aren't thinking about right now. So we've pushed it back this far and under two weeks I don't think is going to be uh, uh, a major, major thing. And I guess the suggestion would be we table it for two weeks, ask for some more uh, research to be done, and 
it sounds like there is an interest in removing those two days in June to look at what options may be available. David? I, I, I'm concerned about further delay, but if administration tells us that another two weeks is acceptable, I'm not going to. Uh, Can't say they've said that. <laughs> no, no, or and or I know Gwen, I, I, I know that there, I, I want you to have closure, so as well as the calendar committee. So like I said, I am completely comfortable with letting the chips fall where they may tonight. Yep. I, I, I'm just, if the administration doesn't necessarily feel that two weeks is gonna be helpful or use of their time, I don't wanna delay it either. So I. Because I think the process discussion that the administration has shared with us is a valid point. So I'm not sure that there's a lot more work that really they, Rick, <laughs> that we could ask you to do on this, really. Well, we, we can come back, you know, I mean, I, I, we could come back with uh, the detail options. I, you know, again, I don't know if those are the two days to, if you want to, you know, if you want to direct us to find those two days. We can find out again. I, I look at one first semester, one second semester. I don't know how the balance of the semesters work, um, and I don't know the other detail that the, that the task force was studying, putting forward either. So, I believe our semesters were equal. Oh, 85 in semester one, 86 in semester two. Okay, so, so, that's not a big so it would stay the same. Gwen, do you have any thoughts? Are you? Uh, I'm sure she'd probably ha be right. happier to let us just finish it tonight. Um, you know, we, Randy and I were just commiserating in <laughs> terms of the cha changes or the proposed changes. And, uh, you know, the, the proposal for September 4th and March 25th is pretty much no different than what the calendar is for this current year. So, um, you know, if that is the, if those are the wishes of the board, those are the wishes of the board. And what we're looking at in terms of the calendar for the next two years, we're having a meeting um, on February 3rd, I believe. And the idea is just looking at, trying to look at time differently, and um, which is always a challenge because, um, but but that's what we're committed to. We're, look, we're trying to look at the, cal the entire the calendar, calendar differently. Okay. I appreciate everyone's comments and, and thoughtful about this whole process because you have just experienced the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I suspected that was the case, yes. I appreciate the work and the fact that we do have the final vote and the um, responsibility that goes with that vote. I feel mm -hmm. that. I do want to speak again to the process is my biggest concern is an arbitrary nature of a board decision that we take things at the last minute and do a change that um, that does look good, and there are features about it that I think have a lot of advantages. I see that. I think I should. But too. our role in the I community do. is also advisory. It's a it's a process that needs to flow. So I, I am cautious one. against being too rigid and taking a process at the final point and doing what could be seen by some as just a hard shift. In spite of the fact that yes, there are clearly some advantages to the change. So I have made that point and. Just let that one rest. I guess then um, I'm just going to fall on the sword and say I would like to keep my friendly amendment on the table and ask that for the sake of the committee, for the administration, for our community, that we finalize this tonight. <laughs> and um, I, we will live with whatever that decision is. Additional discussion? I, uh, I would say in reference to the, the process, um, you know, it's 5446 with only 200, you know, with a third of the members voting. And what fee what little yeah. feedback I did, which is unscientific at a school site, you know, there was, I, I think Rob's point about, you know, everybody's going to look at it from their perspective, what works for them and doesn't work for them, as we all would. Um, Dr. Dresden, insight? Uh, I would just offer that... Um, that those two changes bring it back to where this calendar was. That we're, this is a pilot year anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, given that the board earlier tonight took uh, action to look at construction, 
Um, and so we would be looking at construction occurring that, again, probably was not necessarily on the calendar's radar, uh, calendar task force radar, to have that extra weekend and two extra days um, would create some more flexibility for us in the, you know, if we do have a successful referendum, and I'm not assuming that, that's a vote of the public to decide that, but again, it gives us a variable that um, gives us more options. I, I will say that um, I too uh, think we need to take a step back long term and look at a solution, but um, those two days seem to be days that again align with what we're currently doing and uh, would uh, support uh, the, the amendment, the friendly amendment being offered by um, the board here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Dressen. Additional discussion? We will now uh, vote on an amendment to the motion that's on the table, and the amendment is to insert uh, school days on September 4th and March 25th and eliminate June 6th and 7th. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Now we have the main motion on the floor, which has been amended. Um, additional discussion? Yes. All those in favor of approving the amended calendar, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So can we somehow tweak this uh, calendar we have in the packet so that doesn't get out in, you know, make sure we insert that amendment and pretty quickly. Great. Just so my, <laughs> yeah, I just don't want to leave this one sort of in a, as a historical document. No, it confuses people. So maybe we just have to put amended on it or something else in the packet. So it just, it's so just it's just. the other one I think said draft as well. So this will be the final one. Okay. Does this one say draft? Yeah, it does say it draft. It does say draft at okay. the top. Okay. We're on to course offering changes. Yes, sir. Course offering changes for 1516. We've seen this before. Can I get a motion to bring it up for action? So moved. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Randy, would you like to walk us through? Sure. Um, every year we go through the process of updating courses Sorry. that we offer at the secondary level in Edina. This process started last October when staff were asked to review our current uh, courses for changes and propose any new course options for the future. Uh, brief descriptions are attached to this resolution. These courses then get reviewed by principals, by our teachers on special assignment. Uh, they were also brought to our teaching learning board subcommittee and, was, and were previously brought to our school board for discussion. Uh, from here, it, pending approval by the board, these new courses and course changes would enter into our registration guide, and then it would be, um, their fate would be determined by enrollment by students as to whether or not new courses would, be, would actually run and would be offered, or if future changes would be needed. There are 15 new courses proposed, and then on the bottom of the list, we also have drops and course change descriptions and name changes. In terms of the new courses, uh, just to walk through a few of those, um, Everyday Language Arts 7 through 9 is about making time the variable and keeping learning the constant. So it's about flexing time but keeping the level of rigor the same for all students. Uh, African American History is about expanding the perspectives on U.S. history that are currently taught in our courses. Graphic Design Marketing is about text and graphics and marketing. It's really a business prep course. Uh, art and Words is in an interdisciplinary course regarding how words are used in art. Uh, business, dynamic, business Dynamics is about the nature and purpose of business enterprise. The two Project Lead the Way courses are additional courses in the Project Lead the Way uh, curriculum, which is a national curriculum. Uh, the second one is interesting because it's a capstone type course. So students take all of their pre-engineering knowledge and put it to work in a problem solving uh, type course. And that's at, the, um, that's at the top of the list of the Project Lead the Way course that would be offering. Uh, AP Chinese Language and Culture, uh, we've had students through AP Chinese, or through Chinese 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so this is the new Chinese course in the uh, sequence, so the fifth course, if you will. Uh, Accelerated French 1 and 2 are on-roads or on-ramps to begin language at the high school in French, and Internship in Action is about mentorships and internship options for students. 
Online Health 912 will be piloted in terms of one or two sections, and this would be our first true online course um, here at Edina. The course drops are typically dropped because of low enrollment, and sometimes they're replaced by other courses. And the, uh, the other changes are course description changes and name changes. Um, can I just, just for clarification, the Everyday LA isn't everyday for everybody. It's a specific section, correct? Just if correct. That's it's, a confused. it's based upon need for students who need additional time for reading and for language arts skills and meeting the standards. And it's, it's really about um, holding the standard of expectation the same. We expect students to achieve the same standards, but giving them more time to achieve it in a block schedule so they meet every day instead of every other day. I just wanted to be clear that people didn't think Thank we you. were moving to every day. Right, no. Yeah. For yep. everyone. For okay. a specific audience of students. Thank you, yep. Uh, have we made any changes to these since we saw them last month at our discussion? I thought there was a minor tweak. Um, uh, African American history will be offered at both middle schools. Uh, our principals have dialogued about that more and would like to offer that as a new course at both middle schools. Um, we dropped the description called Fab Lab because it's really the space in which the uh, engineering design and development capstone course will be occurring. So we we're, we're in essence describing the space rather than describing the curriculum. Okay. So we kind of made that change. Um, and then linear algebra and differential equations is a drop that was recent. Um, and that course has been replaced. That's it. The, just, this is pure personal curiosity. The middle school courses, what grades are those in? Because there seems to be really limited options for uh, additional coursework there. So some of these are seven, eight, and nine. Some are eight and nine. And um, I'm not sure if any are sixth grade, but they typically are, are the uh, are seventh through ninth grade. Okay, thank you. Additional questions, comments, discussion? All those in favor, uh, approving the new course proposals and the drops. Uh, for 15-16, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up, we have our discussion items. Committee appointments, uh, legislative priorities, and uh, committee appointments uh, we're also going to discuss in our workshop uh, if we don't uh, cancel it after this session. <laughs> Legislative priorities we're working. The legislative priorities we're working with the uh, Edina or Education Minnesota Edina to try to come up with some joint priorities. This was the first draft that we are going to do a refinement draft based on uh, what we now have learned on our legislative side, uh, and I know EME has also come up with some new uh, thoughts. So we'll have some refinement that we're working on and bringing back to the board for action at the uh, January 25th meeting. Additional discussion, announcements? Uh, we would want to welcome uh, Susan Tennyson, our Director of Research and Evaluation for the remainder of uh, the 2015-16 year. Susan served in the Data and Analysis Coordinator position and does a little bit of everything around our next gen work, um, but we're pleased to have her joining the lead team level and she'll do a great job of serving us and her first uh, opportunity for connecting with the board will be next meeting when she does our assessment updates. We welcome uh, Susan to the team. Additional announcements, updates? Anything else? We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Any objection to adjourning at this time? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.